Imagine walking into your IELTS speaking test confident and prepared, knowing no matter what happens, you're going to get the IELTS score that you need. Now picture walking out of the exam center, knowing that you have got the score that you deserve. This might sound impossible, but it's not. I know this because I've helped thousands of students who are struggling just like you get a band seven, eight or nine. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a journey and tell you exactly what band five and six students do differently from band seven seven, eight, and nine students. And these things that band seven, eight, and nine students do differently are easy and simple to learn. You'll discover the hidden traps and common mistakes that trip up many students and learn the key techniques that could skyrocket your score. So if you're ready to go from fear and stress to just knowing exactly what to do on test day and having total confidence, keep watching the video. So the IELTS speaking test has three parts. So I've divided this page into three and we're gonna compare what do band five and six students do very, very differently from band seven, eight and nine students for parts one, parts two and parts three. So let's start off with part one. This is your opportunity to create a great first impression with the examiner. And also, and I think more importantly, it allows you to relax into the test. If you relax into the test in part one, you're going to be much more relaxed and more fluent throughout the entire test. So it is very, very important that you get part one right. So there are three things that band five and six students do differently from band seven, eight and nine students. And I'd like you to look at this clip of two students answering the same question in part one. And I want you to think about which one might be at a band five or a band six level, and which one might be at a band seven or band nine level, um, but really think why. Why are they at that level? Not that they sound more impressive or they have a better accent or they're using fancier words. What are the things that you could copy or that you could stop doing that will really improve your score? So I grew up in Dubai and it's actually one of the um, most populated uh, countries in uh, the GCC. Um, people come here to visit for tourism and uh, it's actually a good spot for um, uh, to visit the largest uh, the largest uh, tower. It's called the Burj Khalifa. I'm from India. To be specific, I am born and raised in Delhi. And my mom is from Bombay and my dad is from Kerala. But I've grown up my entire life here in Delhi. And I went to school here, went to university here. The first student is doing something that examiners are trained to spot. This problem creates the worst first impression and could even get you a band zero. And it is memorized answers. So why is this such a big problem? Well, first of all, the IELTS test is not a memorization test. It is testing your ability to communicate clearly in English, not to memorize a bunch of sentences and repeat them to the examiner. It's also considered cheating. Think about it this way. If you really knew how to speak English to the level that you are trying to get to, would you need to memorize answers? No. And it also lowers your score in two very, very important ways. It makes you sound worse. Listen to this clip and think about how memorization might have led to a low score. I come from India. India is a very populated country. It's the most populated country in the world right now. And we have lots Lots of cultures and lots of traditions and we have many many different languages and uh, we also have different religions and we also celebrate them very much. So did you notice the first problem? I want you to think back to when you were a child in school and think back to those lessons where the teacher got you and the other students to read out loud from the book. How did you feel? Do you think that you sounded fluent or not so fluent. This is exactly how you sound when you memorize an answer. You sound like a robot. But don't worry, there's an easy way to fix that and I'll tell you about it in a second. So did you spot any other issues? Let me explain here what the other issue was. So I want you to imagine this is the destination that you're going for. So you're trying to get to a band nine and we have here student A and we have here student B. So the examiner asks them, tell me about your hometown. Student A talks about the history of their hometown, culture of their hometown, famous things in their hometown, the food, the weather, the nightlife, and on and on and on. Student B just directly answers the question. And this is what the students do. 
they go off topic. And this is why many of you complain about examiners constantly interrupt you and stop you mid-sentence. It's not because the examiner is rude. In part one, they have to ask you a range of different questions. I think between nine and 12 different questions. And if you're giving these very, very long memorized answers, they're going to stop you in the middle of your sentence. You're going to feel, oh, the examiner thinks I'm doing really badly. You're going to get more stressed and you're going to sound even more robotic and your score is going to be terrible. So now you might be thinking, well, how long should they actually be? You're saying don't give very long answers, but should I give short answers? That's not good as well. No, let's look at what band seven and nine students actually do. The strategies students at band seven, eight and nine use are incredibly simple for part one. I discovered this when I was teaching in Saigon in Vietnam. And what I used to do was I would go in maybe 10 or 15 minutes before the class started and I would speak to the students about things that happened at the weekend or sports or the weather, just normal chit chat questions that you would talk to a friend or a work colleague or a teacher about. And during that 10 or 15 minutes before the class started, a lot of students gave band nine answers. Then once the class started, I did something interesting. I would get one of the best students, the students that were the most fluent, that were at a band nine level in those 10 or 15 minutes. And I would do a mock one-on-one -on -one speaking test with them and they would go from band nine to saying something, at the weekend, I went to Vang Tao, I like seafood, they have nice seafood, it was by the sea, it was nice by the sea. So from a band nine down to a band six or seven. And I instantly improved the speaking scores of the entire class by just saying one thing. Why don't you speak in the same way as you did 10 minutes ago? You see, in the 10 minutes before class, they were talking to me like a normal human being, like a normal conversation. They spoke naturally like they would to a friend or a work colleague. And they answered the question directly without going off topic. And I call this test mode. Students go from sounding very, very fluent to as soon as the test starts, sounding like a robot. But how can you overcome that? There's one simple strategy that band nine students use. And I want you to watch these clips and try and figure out the strategy. Is your daily routine different at the weekend compared to during the week? Yes, 100%. So the weekdays are for work, mainly being productive, paying the bills and the weekends I get to do whatever I want to do. So I really treasure and enjoy my weekends. Do you prefer to read magazines or newspapers? Definitely magazines, um, mostly on topics of fashion or interior design. This is what I really like because I like to see creative sides all from all over the world. I like to see what people are talking about, what's new, what's trending. And um, I like to learn, like I like to have knowledge of things of like, what is this called? Or what is that called? Because usually when you see pictures, you don't usually know what it's called. So when you read a magazine or where you get the knowledge, that's that's where you get to know, oh, this fabric is called this or this uh, decoration is called that. So I think it's very good on information. So did you spot it? They simply directly answer the question and then add a little bit more detail. This detail could be an explanation or an example, a personal story. And if that's confusing or overwhelming, just answer the question like you would if you were in a coffee shop with a friend. Remember, they are testing your ability to speak naturally in English, not to memorize a bunch of answers and impress the examiner with fancy structures. So let's now talk about part two of the speaking test. Part two is often the most feared part of the speaking test because it requires you to do something that a lot of students are uncomfortable doing or they're not used to doing. So in part two, you'll be given a cue card that looks like this. And I'll ask you to speak about that topic for up to two minutes. This can be quite scary because it's difficult to speak about anything for two minutes, especially in a foreign language when you're under stress and you have a scary examiner like me looking at you. But what if I told you it wasn't part two that is scary, it is the strategy that students use that leads to low scores. And what's also really interesting is when students stop doing these things that band five and six students do, and they switch to our strategy that our band seven, eight and nine students use, not only do their scores improve, but part two becomes something that they look forward to. It is their chance to shine and show the examiner how great they are without any worry, without any stress. First, listen to 
to this student and see if you can spot any problems with what they're doing. Describe some food or drink that you learned to prepare. Um, I don't really prepare much food or drink because uh, my wife does most of that for me, but uh, uh, food or drink you learn to prepare uh, does uh, a cocktail uh, count. I know how to make a Bloody Mary. Uh, when and where you learn to prepare this? Uh, I learned to prepare it uh, one morning uh, when I was thirsty. Uh, how you learn to prepare it? Um, I just looked up, up YouTube and explain how you felt about learning to prepare it. Um, I don't know. Uh, it quenched my thirst. So did you spot what the problem was? What most students do is they look at the topic and then they talk about bullet point number one, then bullet point number two, then bullet point number three, then bullet point number four. But why is that a problem? Well, first of all, there might be one or more of these bullet points that you just don't have much to say about them. So what food was it? Cocktail, it was a Bloody Mary, but there's not much you can really say about that apart from what the thing is. How I learned to do it, again, I learned it on YouTube, not a big deal, I can't really talk much about that. So it's really limiting the amount I can talk. And remember, it is a test of speaking for up to two minutes. Then there might be a bullet point that you just feel uncomfortable talking about or you don't really know what to say for that. So explain how you felt. I don't really have major feelings about Bloody Marys and about cocktails. I just made it up on the spot. That makes it extremely difficult to speak fluently for up to two minutes. And then once you get to the end there after I don't know, 20, 30 seconds for the average student, you run out of things to say and you're like, oh, I've only been talking for 30 seconds. I'm going to fail my test and everything gets worse and worse as you get more stressed and more stressed. So this is the most common strategy. And what does it lead to? Poor fluency, run out of things to say and feel like you've failed. I've done so many tests with students who were doing really well in part one. Then I was like, this student might be at a band seven or a band eight. And then they use this strategy and completely fall apart. So what do band seven, eight and nine students do differently? I want you to listen to this student who got a band nine and look at the cue card and think about what they're doing. What are they doing differently to these band five and six students? Food that I learned to prepare. Um, I'm pescatarian, so I don't eat meat, um, but I love food and I have a gluten intolerance, so I can't eat a lot of the Indian food. So this is a little recipe that I learned how to make, which is basically paneer. Um, we call it cottage cheese in English. Um, it's like a, it's like a spiced tomato base with cottage cheese um, with paratha, roti, but it's made out of ragi flour, which is gluten-free and super rich in calcium and very good for people with diabetes, although I don't have diabetes. It's very nutritious, basically. Together, it's the perfect meal. It keeps you full. I, I love being healthy. I try to be as healthy as I can. So, um, yeah, that's probably my go-to meal in the evening because I don't have to think about I have all the ingredients. I don't have to think about how to make it. It's kind of automatic and it's delicious, which is the most important part. It's not compromising on the taste because I can't eat salmon and rice every day. I want to eat something that's more um, flavorful and uh, nutritious. Sometimes when I'm feeling adventurous, I like to eat it with uh, yogurt, either Greek yogurt or regular yogurt and add a couple Indian spices into it and mix it up. So the spiciness of the paneer, cottage cheese, um, the, the texture, like a drier, stiffer texture of the ragi roti, and the creaminess and coldness of the yogurt is match made in heaven. So hopefully you spotted they don't stick to the bullet points. Instead, what they do is they focus on the main topic. So they're always talking about the main topic, but they're not necessarily using all of the bullet points. What they do instead is they have the freedom to add other bullet points. So within that main topic, they are adding things that they feel more comfortable talking about whilst talking about that main topic. For example, if you got this cue card, you might feel very comfortable talking about these two bullet points, but this third bullet point 
is going to take only a few seconds to talk about. And then this fourth bullet point is something that you don't really know anything about and you don't feel comfortable talking about it. But you might find it easy to talk about other things related to the main topic, such as a description of the main topic, a story, how you feel about it, something about the past or something that you hope to do in the future related to the main topic or any other point that you feel comfortable talking about. Now, should you use all of those ideas? No just the ones that will help you speak fluently for up to two minutes. And anyone that tells you you must talk about each bullet point in order doesn't know what they're talking about. Now let's move on to, in my opinion, the most difficult part of the speaking test, part three. Why is it so difficult? I want you to listen to these students and think about the questions. Don't focus too much on the answers, but focus on the questions being asked and think about how you might respond to them. Do you think that it's better to buy a property or rent a property? Um. No. Should the same regulations apply to online advertising? Everywhere. You mean the by the regulation... Um on the, I cannot learn the, the name, how to say it. Um, let's uh, jump okay. to another question. So as you heard, part three questions are a lot more challenging than the typical part one question. But like everything with the IELTS test, the problem is not the questions. The problem is the strategy that students use to answer them. So let's start off with the things that you should not do. The most important thing that you should avoid is no response. If you say to the examiner, well, I don't know, or just nothing comes out of your mouth, or I've even had students burst out laughing in my face when I ask them some part three questions, what you are saying saying to the examiner is, my English is not good enough to answer this question. But what happens if you really do have no idea? Some of these questions are very, very difficult. We'll give you a strategy for how to tackle any question, no matter what the topic is in a second. The second thing that you should never do is give a short answer. And short answers in part three of the test normally have nothing to do with your English level or your speaking skills. 15 minutes of talking in a foreign language in a very stressful situation with somebody scary and horrible like me looking at you and judging you is an exhausting process. It is often more related to fatigue, to tiredness than it is to English ability. So what they do is um, something that you should never do is they surrender. They just give up. They're just saying, I surrender. I don't want to answer more of these questions. My level is not as high as you really think it is. But I have some really, really good news for you. And this is something that not many IELTS students know or understand. I think it's a bit of a secret. I don't know whether I should be telling you this. But in part three, the examiner has lots of different questions that they could ask you. They have some easier questions and some more difficult questions. If you get a really difficult question, that is an exceptionally good sign. That means that the examiner thinks that you might be at a band seven, eight or nine. And they're asking you these more difficult questions to really stretch your speaking ability and separate the band sevens from the band eights from the band nines. So now that you know if you get a difficult question that it's a good thing and you're very happy about it, how do you tackle those difficult questions? The first and most important thing is always attempt an answer. But what if you have no idea? Well, you could do something like this. I'm not too familiar with the topic of AI and its relation with uh, education. However, in my knowledge, I do know that AI is developing more and more and it might be able to replace some uh, teacher's jobs or tasks, but it will not replace the trait of empathy. Remember, it is not a knowledge test. It is not an IQ test. It is not a test of how much you know about that topic. It is a speaking test. Again, if you say nothing, what you're telling the examiner is, I don't deserve a high score. But if you attempt an answer, even if it is in that limited way, the examiner will think, okay, they might not know much about that topic. Let's change topics. Let's ask them about something slightly differently and see how they get on. And you'll probably get something you do know about. But it is far more likely in part three, you will get some kind of a topic that you do know something about. So how do you shine? How do you show the examiner that you do deserve a band seven, eight or nine? Watch this clip and think about what the student does in terms of how they structure their answer. What skills does a person need to be a great chef? Hmm, interesting. I think 
I mean, from what I've heard, I've never worked as a chef or worked in a kitchen before, but I think it takes a lot of trial and error. So for that reason, I would imagine that the person would have to be very patient. And with that patience, you need to have an inherent uh, passion for the food that you're making. I think chefs usually specialize in in one or more cuisines. Um So just having an understanding of the background of the spices, where it comes from, of the meat, where it comes from. If you're not passionate about that, it can probably tire you out to be that invested in learning. So patience, passion, and a good environment, like access to good teachers, access to good books, access to good produce would probably help you hone your craft a lot more. So they did four things here. They directly answer the question. They then explained why they think that or why other people think that. They then backed it up with examples or you could include a personal story. And then they developed it even more by showing the other side or you could give a new point. But here's the most important thing. Here's the key lesson for the entirety of the speaking test. What do all of these band seven, eight, and nine students have in common? Well, when you're talking to a band seven, eight, or nine student, it doesn't feel like a speaking test. It feels like having a normal conversation. Band seven, eight, and nine students answer questions naturally, and they do that by steering the conversation to things that are easy and comfortable for them to talk about. They don't use tricks or hacks to try and cheat the test. It can't be cheated. Instead, they use the English they already have, the ability they already have to clearly communicate naturally with the examiner and show them the score they really deserve. And that's how they get the score that they really deserve. But very importantly, if you don't practice all of that, you're never going to be able to do it on test day. So here's a video that gives you access to more than a thousand IELTS speaking questions and shows you how to practice at home for free. Hope you enjoyed the lesson and I'll see you again next time.